Welcome to this node breakdown for Mardini 2024 with Grayscale Gorilla. This is day 16, and today's node is the Ocean Spectrum SOP. So the Ocean Spectrum SOP is a SOP level geometry node. If we dive inside and just drop an Ocean Spectrum, you'll end up with this over here. You won't see a thing, right? To actually see what this is doing, we're going to need to use an Ocean Evaluate. So the first thing we're actually going to use is an Ocean Evaluate. Right over here, we just plug this into the second input of the Ocean Evaluate. And once again, you won't see anything. But over here on the Ocean Evaluate, you can either put in a geometry to deform or use the preview grid. If you use the preview grid, you will now see your Ocean Spectrum. I would recommend using a deform input grid. So let's just drop a grid over here, give it a particular size. We're going to make it quite big, so 1000 by 1000. And I'm going to give it a lot of rows and columns. You can go higher than this but we're just gonna use 500 for now, right? So this is our ocean spectrum. What it's doing is it's generating a spectrum. You can see over here that it's got a bunch of attributes and a couple of volumes. And then it's using this ocean evaluate to actually apply those settings to a geometry. So this is going to have some issues. Clearly it's very tiled and it doesn't really look like an ocean just yet. If we play this back, you will see that there is movement though. The movement in this direction is of course set up by your ocean spectrum. If we go to the Ocean Spectrum node over here, we have a bunch of settings. Firstly, we have the resolution exponent. You can think of this as the actual total resolution of your Ocean Spectrum. If we have a higher value, we have higher resolution, so we have smaller frequencies. If we have lower values, we have less detail. So as you can see, when I drop this to a value of say two, only the very large movements are kept in the Ocean Spectrum. A value between seven and nine is generally going to be okay. The grid size over here is just going to be the actual size of a particular grid block. If we just change this to 20, you can see that this assumes a much smaller ocean. The value of 50 is generally going to be okay, so we can leave that for now. The next important setting over here is really just going to be our time scale. Over here, we're going to push up our time scale, and this is going to increase the speed of our ocean playback, right? But now this is not physically accurate. This doesn't necessarily mean a faster moving ocean. All we're doing is we're playing it back in two times speed. So it can look a bit weird, but sometimes you may want to adjust your time scale. To actually adjust the speed of your ocean, we'll go down here to wind. Over here, we have direction and speed. Direction is just going to be the direction that your waves are moving in. So as you can see, they are currently moving in the positive x-axis. As we adjust this direction, it's going to be rotating around the y-axis. So as we move this around, you'll see that at 90, it's moving in positive z. When we reach 180, it's going to be moving in negative x. When we reach 270, it's going to be moving in negative z. And then 360 is just going to be back to positive x. Our wind speed over here is going to increase the dynamic range of our ocean. What this means is that you're going to have higher highs and lower lows. So as we push this up, you'll start to notice that. And this is going to be suggestive of higher wind speeds. As for the swell, this is going to be a value which works in conjunction with our direction. A value of zero means that we have waves moving in the direction that we've selected and against the direction that we've selected. If we push it up to one, then all our waves will move only in the direction that we've selected. And when we drop it down to minus one, they'll be moving against the direction we selected. So our ocean ends up with actually no directionality at all. As for fetch, this is going to be how far away from the shore we are. Generally for an ocean, you're gonna be using something like 300, but if you're working on shallower waters, you may drop this. And as you drop this, you'll notice a very different look in your ocean. Chop is going to define how sharp the peaks of your waves are. So as we push this up, you'll see that they pull together more tightly. As we drop this, they expand out. And this is where we're mostly going to be working with our look. I'm just gonna drop our speed back down to something reasonable like five, and then go over to amplitude. Amplitude is just going to be a scaling factor for our ocean. As we push this up, you end up with exaggerated values, right? So it's just a multiplier. We don't really need to worry about the rest of it over here. The next thing that we do want to look at though is wave instancing. Wave instancing is going to help us get rid of this tiling that we have over here. To effectively do some wave instancing, we're going to use a scatter node on a particular geometry. So on our grid over here, I'm going to scatter some points and you'll notice that they're not very evenly distributed. To evenly distribute them, let's go over here and increase our max relax radius so that our points are now more evenly distributed. Plug this into the wave instancing points and let's see what we have. What you'll notice is that we end up with little patches. If I decrease the number of points that we have to something like 50, you can see exactly what this is doing. Each and every point is having a patch of waves instanced to it. But over here, we actually have a wave instancing tab and this is all just variation. Each and every point 
is going to have a radius of 20, a rotation of 0, an amplitude of 0 0.8, with these respective variations. So as I increase the number of points that I have to 100, you'll start to see more of these little patches of ocean, right? When I get to something like, say, 2000, this is where we'll basically be forming an actual ocean surface. If you're still having issues where we have these empty patches, go ahead and increase the scale radius as well to a value of something like 10, and that will give you a very uniformly distributed scatter. If we take a look at it now, it's a lot more difficult to see where our tiling is. This has basically removed all of the tiling from our ocean spectrum. Do keep in mind that these points over here are additive. So if we increase the number of points to something like 8,000, it's going to actually cause our ocean to kind of have these little artifacts and things where we have really high peaks because it's stacking a bunch of points on top of each other and just adding their amplitudes together. So try not to stack too many points too close together. Lastly, we're going to be looking at this mask over here. When we use this mask type of suppression and we add a noise, you'll see that it flattens out some areas of our ocean spectrum. And this is actually going to be realistic, but we need to make some minor changes to the settings over here. So we don't actually want it to perfectly flatten out different areas. So over here where we have our input and output range, we're just going to increase the zero value to something like 0 0.3. This is just going to ensure that we don't have any areas of our noise which are getting a value of zero, right? This is going to ensure that we still have some level of this ocean spectrum being applied, even in the flatter areas. So just like that. Now, to actually use an ocean spectrum, there are a bunch of ways. And to get an idea of how it's used, you can even go over here to your oceans tab. And let's just take a look at some of the shelf tools. We can click on a small ocean that will generate just a small ocean for us. You can see that it will do all of the things that I showed you. It'll just add some extra nodes for outputting. So we have an ocean spectrum being applied to an ocean evaluate. And we have a preview grid over here. If we play this back, you can see the type of ocean that we have. So spectra is just a special collection of data that Houdini recognizes, and it can use the information within it. You can see all of the information over here. But when we save it to disk, we are only just saving it as a bgeo.sc file. So just the regular geo file that Houdini recognizes. We can then use it in our renderer to actually affect displacement of an ocean grid. You'll see that it actually added this Houdini ocean procedural node for us, and it fetches the spectra from disk to render. This is just something that the small ocean shelf tool did for us. So if we go ahead and save that to disk and then go back to our stage level, it can now use that for rendering. But there is a little bit of setup involved in actually previewing an ocean in Karma. So let's just go to Solaris. We'll need to drop a camera and a light. And then the last thing we need is just a Karma render settings node. So we drop a Karma node over here. And after our Karma render settings, if we want to view our ocean in our viewport, so let's just go ahead and see what we have. You'll see that we just have this flat plane over here, right? To actually view our ocean, what we have to use is a preview Houdini procedurals. We plug this in over here, set the display flag, and you'll see a very low resolution ocean. To see the higher resolution one, go over to your ocean procedural, and here where it says viewport quality, just put this up to one. And just like that, we have an ocean being rendered. So it's not just the small ocean that uses it, we also have the large ocean and the guided ocean layer. If we use the large ocean, it's much the same as the small ocean, it's just an extended version. So it's doing this version over here where we scatter, split to create two spectrums, merge them together, and then run it through into our ocean evaluate. And then we also have the guided ocean layer. This is much more complex because it actually uses a flip solver and our ocean spectrum. So you can see over here, it creates a spectra. The wave tank then gets fed into a guided ocean layer. And you can see that this is what's used for simulating oceans. The last thing that I want to mention is just this over here with the ocean evaluate. When we run it over a grid like this and we're applying the information from the ocean spectrum onto this grid, there are some other ways of doing this and it doesn't always have to be a grid. For example, if I had to just drop a rubber toy, increase its size, increase the subdivisions, you'll see that it actually gets affected by this ocean spectrum, right? It gets deformed by the ocean spectrum. But we have other ways of actually working with this ocean spectrum that doesn't use the ocean evaluate. What you can use is an attribute VOP over here. And in the left side, I'll just grab a geometry. In fact, it can even just be some scattered points. We can take our ocean spectrum into second input. Inside here, you can use an ocean sample layers. And all it takes is the position of your geometry, the current time. And then the file name is going to be our second input, which is our ocean spectrum. Put that in over there. And it gives us a bunch of outputs. So firstly, for displacement, you can just add it to your original position. So take the position of your grid, add the displacement, output it as position, 
and you have that over there. Now, all of these points over here are being deformed by our ocean spectrum, but we're not using an evaluate anymore. Additionally, we can also output things like cusp. So cusp is going to be that sharpness. So if I put this out to CD, you can see that this gives us the peaks of the spectrum. Additionally, we even have access to things like velocity. So if I plug that into color, you can see that as well. So of course, when we have access to this much data, it opens up a lot of creative avenues for us. We can put this into pop networks. We can use this to drive other sorts of simulations. As long as we know where the data exists and how to manipulate it, there's loads of things that we can do with it. But that's all for this video. So tomorrow's video is going to be covering the flip solvers up. And so I'll be seeing you there. Bye.